So I'd like to welcome all of you for the arthroscopy session here. And this is on the individualized ACL surgery, the a la carte approach. In the past, we always believed that ACL tears and ACL reconstruction is, you know, one thing. You have an ACL tear, you land up with an ACL reconstruction. But over the, many, the last few years, we've realized that not all ACL tears are the same. Their locations are different. When they present to you is different. Not all ACL tears behave in the same way. And therefore, not all ACL surgeries should be the same. And therefore, this symposium on individualized ACL surgery, the a la carte approach. We've got four very distinguished speakers here, three of them with me. Uh, Dr. Anand Joshi, Dr. Abhay Narvekar, Nikhil Ayer, and myself. And we're going to go through the different approaches for ACL tears and the a la carte approach that all of us use for these tears. And for the first presentation by Dr. Nikhil Ayer, it's going to be on acute ACL tears and the role of repair. ACL repair is something that's new, and he's going to go through the technique and the outcomes of these procedures. Nikhil, please. Thank you, Dr. Padiwala. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Bombay Orthopedic Society and the team of IROC Max for inviting me to give this talk here. I'm going to be speaking primarily about ACL repairs, that is ACL avulsion repairs. Since this is a talk about ACL tears, I'm keeping out the topic of tibial side ACL avulsion fractures, which technically is a fracture and not an ACL tear. The first primary ACL repair was reported in 1895 by Mayor Robson. And in the 1970s, open ACL repair was the gold standard for all ACL injuries. This classic paper by Figgin and uh, Curl in 1976 reported a re-rupture rate of more than 50% in ACL repairs. And this brought the downfall of uh, ACL repairs. At around the same time, ACL reconstruction was being developed and several randomized controlled trials were showing improved outcomes with ACL reconstruction compared to a repair. And by around the 1990s, open ACL repair was almost completely abandoned and ACL reconstruction was now the gold standard for all ACL injuries. The question is, were we comparing oranges with apples in comparing ACL repairs with ACL reconstruction? Primary ACL repair, as it was described, was an open procedure with resultant morbidity from the arthrotomy itself. Arthroscopic techniques were only developed somewhere around the 1990s, and by that time, primary repair was nearly abandoned. Most studies that were done did not take into consideration the location of the tear, and most included repairs for mid-substance tear also. Vandalist and Defilis are very critical about Figen and Curl's paper, which is often quoted as an evidence against primary repairs. According to them, the poor surgical technique of using an absorbable suture in a figure of eight fashion to fix the repair onto the iliotibial band was the major cause of failures in their study. Now, in the last 10 years, there has been renewed interest in ACL repairs again. It was commonly thought that ACL tears didn't have the potential to heal and help restore uh, knee stability. But uh, papers from Stedman et al. and Costa and Pez has documented healing of the ACL. Work done by Vandalist and Defilis is also very encouraging, has shown very good results with ACL repairs. Now, the main advantage of an ACL repair over a reconstruction is it is less invasive. That is, the tunnels drilled for the repair are less than half the size of the bone tunnels required for an ACL reconstruction. ACL repair has the potential to preserve native insertion site as well, which in turn leads to a more normal joint mechanics and has decreased risk of post-traumatic arthritis. It avoids graft-side morbidity like anterior knee pain and weakness of the hamstring, 
and per se no bridges are burnt. In case there's a failure, you can always do a reconstruction. Now, understanding the Sherman classification is very important for doing a good ACL repair. Type 1 is the true avulsion where there's hardly any ACL tissue left on the femur. Type 2 is around 20% of ACL tissue left on the femur. Type 3 has about 33% tissue left on the femur. And type 4 are the mid-substance tear, which are about 50% uh, of the tissue still left on the femur. Patient selection is the most important thing for a successful ACL repair. Higher failure rates are seen in younger patients. Patients actively involved in competitive sports also showed higher failure rates. So my ideal candidates are not very young and are low demand patients not involved in active sports. Mid-substance tears have very poor results. The best candidates are type 1. You can stretch it for type 2 tears also. A good remnant quality is mandatory for doing an ACL repair. And most studies have shown good result in doing early surgery, that is within the first two to three weeks of injury. There are four techniques which have been described in literature. The suture tape augmentation, the ruptured parts of the ACL are brought together with lasso sutures and protected with a 2 mm wide high strength tape which acts as an internal brace to provide stable environment in which the ACL can heal. This also protects the ACL during the healing period and allows for early mobilization. The suture anchor uh, primary repair technique, similarly the ACL is sutured from the distal aspect of the remnant till the avulsion part and both the posteromedial and the, sorry, posterolateral and the anteromedial bundles can be fixed back with the help of knotless anchors to their respective footprint. Most of the times this is also augmented by a tape. Now the dynamic intraligamentary stabilization which has been described is similar to uh, tape augmentation. The only difference being on the tibial side, the, I think the video is not, uh, is it playing? Yeah. On the tibial side, the tape is fixed on a spring screw system. This dynamic fixation provides biomechanical stability and a stable environment for the ACL to heal. Now, bridge enhanced techniques involve suture repair of ligament, which is combined with a bioactive scaffold to bridge the gap between the torn ligament ends. Now, lastly, this is a surgery which I'm showing. You can see this is a type 1 avulsion. Uh, luckily, in this patient, you can see both the bundles very clearly. I usually use a flexible cannula, like the passport cannula, and uh, I use an anti-grade suture passing device. My preference is to have a cinched lasso as the first stitch at the distal end of the remnant. And then I take continuous sutures all the way till the avulsed part. Once you have done this for both the bundles, you use this suture to retract the ACL off your, out of your way so that you can work in the notch. Once you look inside the notch, with an owl, you make you identify the center of the footprint. Beware you should not use your shaver, let all the tissue be there. I use an outside in guide to create my femoral tunnel and through this tunnel pass a shuttling suture along with a tape. The tape is loaded on a button which is on the lateral cortex and the suture, the repair sutures will also be tied on the same button. Now the tape which has come will be passed through a tunnel in the tibia on the anterior third of the ACL and this is tied either on an endo button or a knotless anchor. Once this is done and the repair is complete, here you can see the ACL has gone back all the way to the uh, attachment. This step is very important where you make marrow vents to improve the biology and help in the ACL healing. You can see at the end of the repair, you have good tension, a well-positioned, a well-directed ACL, and most of these patients, if selected well, will do well. So the take-home would be patient selection is the most important thing in a primary ACL repair. In the right patient, ACL repair has shown equal or better outcomes than an ACL reconstruction. Surgical technique has to be meticulous, paying attention to biology. There are limited studies today and a good, there is a requirement for good random control trial in the future. Thank you.
think I'll welcome Dr. Pardiwala for his next talk on remnant uh, preserving techniques. So we'll take all the question and answers at the end of the session. So you can make a note of your questions and all four of us will then answer these in one shot. So I'm going to cover remnant preservation techniques for subacute ACL tears. And we've just seen that not all ACL t injuries are the same. You've got different types of injuries based on where it takes place, the type 1, 2, 3, and 4, based on the location, but also on the duration. So you've got an acute ACL tear, which may have some potential for healing, and you've got the chronic, which will retract and therefore have no remnant also left, and the very chronic, which are going to have secondary changes. But in between, you get the subacute, and the subacute are from six weeks to three months. So six weeks to 12 weeks is when they'll present to you. And if they present to you with a large stump, they're type one or two, it might be worthwhile to consider a remnant preservation technique. So what do I mean by a remnant preservation technique? So you've got a patient like this who had either a type one or a type two ACL avulsion, which didn't heal. So some of these will actually heal, you heard the papers that Nikhil alluded to. Some of these will heal, and the guys who heal don't require anything. But in case this patient comes to you at six weeks, eight weeks, or 12 weeks with an unhealed ACL, and either instability or clinical signs of laxity, then it's worthwhile to consider a remnant preservation. And for remnant preservation, there are basically three techniques. So this is the first one. This is a patient with a type one ACL stump. So this. ACL has avulsed directly off the bone and therefore this stump can be resutured or refixed back to the footprint. So what do you do? You do a ACL reconstruction but with a small diameter graft and you call this, you could term this as biological internal bracing. So you will go ahead with your standard ACL reconstruction but while you're doing that, you make sure that your, your remnant out there is not damaged. So on the femur, you make your bundle, your socket within the AM bundle. In the tibia, you tend to be a little more posterior than a standard one. And the reason for that is that you want to preserve the anterior tibial attachment of the ACL because that's something that really can't be reconstructed by any means. And so once you've done that, then you put a suture anchor in there. Now to use the suture anchor, you need a curved delivery device because you need to be in the region of the PL bundle. So you need to be just adjacent to your tunnel. You need a curved device so that this doesn't go into the socket. And you put your suture there. You then take your bites in the ACL remnant at this stage itself before you pass your grafts. So you've made your femoral socket first you've made your tibial socket, then you put your anchor in. Once you've put your anchor in, you're gonna take multiple sutures through the remnant. Once you've taken these sutures through the remnant, you can just park your sutures aside. Then retracting the remnant, you'll pass your graft through. So that's the graft going through. Now this graft shouldn't be a nine or a 10. This should ideally be no more than an eight. You fix your graft both on the femur and the tibia and then you tie down the sutures that you've already taken. So basically what you've got is an ACL reconstruction or your biological internal brace and you've sutured the remnant like an envelope on top. And by doing this, you've got this whole anterior aspect out here that you preserve. This fan-shaped anterior aspect, there's no way that you can reconstruct this either with cylindrical or with flat grafts. Now your type 2 stumps, so the type 2s are avulsions in which you have at least 20% of the remnant here on the femur. So that remnant of course comes off, but because this is a stable stump, this is adherent to the PCL, 
This is not going to flip anteriorly and cause a subsequent impingement or a cyclops. So you pass your graft through. This is also known as the Samba technique. And once you've passed your graft through, this graft is tunneled through your stable stump. And because it's stable, no further suturing is necessary. And finally, the third technique, which is a type 2 avulsion, but with an unstable ACL stump. So this stump is not really adherent to the PCL. This is likely to fall off. So therefore, once you've taken your femoral socket and you've taken your tibial socket, you take sutures through the stump, but these don't go into an anchor. These are going to be tied onto the graft itself. So you've taken a suture. This suture is around the graft which is passed. And then all you need to do is tie it down. So again, you've got your internal brace or your ACL reconstruction done there. And then the anterior part of the remnant gets sutured there. And once you've done that, make sure that you've got full knee extension. So that's critical. You want to make sure that your ACL graft construct is not so large that it causes any impingement. And it's this reason that you need to move a little more posteriorly in your ACL tibial footprint to ensure that you haven't got any impingement. So what's the novelty of this technique? It offers the best of both worlds, I think. You get the best of both worlds, both from repair and from ACL reconstruction. So you're doing an ACL reconstruction, which is a time-tested technique. You're not risking a failure of an ACL repair. You're restoring your complex native anatomy of the ACL, especially that fan-shaped tibial insertion, and therefore you're restoring your healing and your biology and you're restoring your neuroreceptors there. This potentially also restores your rotational kinematics of the knee. And there's a study that seems to suggest that your graft rupture rates are much less if you do remnant preservation versus non-pregnant preservation. And most importantly, because you're doing it in the subacute phase and you're not doing it in the acute phase like you do for an ACL repair, you don't have the risk of arthrofibrosis and you'd also be able to identify the patients who may heal with non-operative treatment. We've done a study where we've actually done numerous MRIs on this, and you can see that that's the ACL there, that's the graft, and this is the remnant there, the anterior part of the tibia, and we find that this almost always predictably heals onto the graft, and therefore this healing is important for all of these advantages, these potential advantages to take place. And on our post-op MRIs, we've been able to document that. So in conclusion, although it's technically more complex than a standard ACL reconstruction, I think a remnant preservation technique, which we call as biological internal bracing with remnant ACL repair, I think this provides potential advantages and should be considered for unhealed subacute ACL avulsions that present to you between six weeks to 12 weeks. Thank you. I'm now going to request Dr. Anand Joshi to cover conventional ACL reconstruction techniques. When and how should we do this? When uh, Dinshaw called me and said that I have to speak on uh, conventional ACL reconstruction, when and how, the first thing I did was to open up a dictionary to find out what was the meaning of conventional. And it means confirming or adhering to accepted standards. But as we all know, the only permanent thing in life is change. And there are no accepted standards, just as the institution of marriage in 1900s and the present day live-in relationship. So conventions keep on changing. In the early 90s, when we started doing ACL reconstructions, the convention was using the bone patella tendon bone because it was considered as the gold standard. We did a wide notch plasty to accommodate this bone patella tendon bone. We used trans-tibial uh, drilling techniques 
to reach the so called isometric or physiometric glass graph placement site we use screws for fixation either from inside uh, or outside in and this was followed by immobilization and a slow rehab process however in the 21st century we have various graft options we use the hamstrings predominantly about, about 70% of uh, people who do acl reconstruction use the hamstrings classically we have also rediscovered the central quad tendon some surgeons like to use the peroneus longus for acl reconstructions we have realized that anatomic graft placement is biomechanically superior to the uh, isometric placement of the graft to achieve this we have changed our uh, femoral tunnel positioning from transtibial to transportal we now have different fixation options both distant and aperture we try and preserve biology to whatever uh, extent possible and we have customized rehab for each and every patient who undergoes an acl reconstruction now ha why has this shift occurred i think it is predominantly because we have seen a distinct change in the patient population in the early 90s we believed that only athletes required acl reconstructions today almost 80% of our patients are the non athletic population today because of easy access to mris we have early detection and intervention so we don't need extensive notch plasties we don't see patients with osteophytes impinging in the notch we have improved understanding which where we have realized that there are grafts which can be superior to the bone patella tendon we have learned from our observations and complications knowing that transtibial very often leads to vertical graft placement and poor rotational stability and of course advances in instrumentation has helped us uh, in refining our techniques as dinsho has already said not all acls are same we do not routinely see mid substance ruptures or a nodule of the acl we very often see single bundle failure of the acl or an acl which has just been detached from the femoral side and here is a classic case where you can see that the acl has been detached and you can excise just the nodule of the acl in these situations and do what is called a biological internal bracing of the knee over the years after looking at our failures we have re realized that we should not concentrate only on acl tears but also address the peripheral regions in fact in all our acls almost 18 to 24% have a lesion in the posterior medial corner of the knee which is commonly called the ramp lesion and this needs to be addressed if you have to have uh, better outcomes after your acl now when should you operate an acl i think we do not like to operate an acl when the knee is swollen stiff and painful we do not want to uh, add in uh, the surgical uh, insult to an injured knee so we do not operate when there is significant bone bruising and we always want to do a good prehab before deciding which patient needs an acl reconstruction because you need to differentiate between copers and non copers in the chronic stage you can operate only if the patient has symptomatic instability and we never do an acl in an already arthritic knee so here are the steps which we routinely follow in the anatomic acl reconstruction and i like to use the kiss principle keeping it super simple as aristotle has already said has said we are what we repeatedly do excellence then is not an act but a habit and therefore i like to do my acls in a sequential fashion where i do a, a diagnostic round followed by a graft harvest ending up with the tunneling graft passage and cyclic loading for me the diagnostic round is extremely important because that gives me an idea of how much graft is required it also tells me what are the uh, uh, associated lesions that need to be treated a meniscal repair that uh, needs to be carried out or an opening on the posterolateral or the anterolateral sides which may necessitate uh, extra articular structure once the diagnostic round is done, uh, done then i go for the graft harvest in majority of the patients we use a single semitendinosus 
wherever we find that the semitendinosus is not adequate, we opt for the gracilis as well. It is very important that uh, you make sure that you have a robust graft because this is very often can compromise the outcomes of your ACL reconstruction. In recent years, there has been a tendency for uh, surgeons to compensate for the weak hamstring using so-called internal bracing, but we have seen disastrous results with internal bracing and there has to be a word of caution. These fiber polyester tapes inside the knee may create uh, adverse reactions leading to uh, complete failure of a graft uh, uh, construct as can be seen in this case. Whenever you find that the hamstring is inadequate, we have recently started going to the central quad tendon and we, and we have found that it has extremely less comorbidity, uh, donor site morbidity as compared to the bone patella tendon bone. The femoral uh, tunnel is drilled by using a uh, flexible reamer system. This allows us to retain the fat pad as well as the ligamentum mucosum. You do not have to flex the knee beyond 90 degrees. So excellent visualization of the femoral footprint is easily possible by using this flexible reamer system. On the TBL side, the TBL tunneling also is equally important and we use this footprint guide. Various landmarks are used like the medial uh, TBL spine, the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Without disrupting the TBL side of the ACL, we normally make a window in the ACL doing what is so-called the Samba technique and the graft is then railroaded. Whenever possible, it is a good idea to make sure that the endo button has exited out on the lateral cortex and, is, as in, and flipped so that you don't land up with an endo button either in the soft tissue or in the bony tunnel. Once your graft is in place, cyclic loading is done and the tibial side uh, fixation can be done either using distant fixation like a suture disc or if your graft is long enough and uh, at the tibial aperture, we like to use uh, screw fixation and I prefer the titanium screws instead of the biodegradable ones. So finally, to summarize what the conventional ACL today is the ABCD concept of the ACL. That means you want to do an anatomic ACL, preserving the biology, having a strong construct and addressing the associated deficiencies. So this is the conventional ACL in this century. Thank you very much. And we have Dr. Abhay Narvekar, who's going to take the fourth lecture in this. And this is on the concept of lateral extraarticular tenodesis. So we know that in some scenarios, you need something more than just anatomy. So what are those scenarios and how do we do this? Dr. Abhay Narvekar is going to cover. Thank you, Dinshaw. The lateral extraarticular tenodesis is nothing new. It is basically a Lemaire's procedure, which is now sort of modified a bit. The thing is that when we do an ACL reconstruction, we want to provide both rotational as well as translational stability. And more often than not, the failure of ACL is not so much because of an anterior posterior translation. It is basically because of a rotational pivoting. And we all know that rotations are best controlled from the periphery. And this is uh, one of the papers, an old paper by Andrew Emmis, where he has shown that the force on the ACL is probably six times the force that is seen by the anterolateral ligament. Now, a Sigon's fracture, which is part and parcel of an ACL injury, tells you that there is an anterolateral structural injury along with the ACL. So this has been described by Paul Sagan in 1879, a lateral ligament has been described by Houston and Andrews okay, as uh, late as in 1976. So what are these anterolateral structural complex? It's basically the IT band, the deep IT band, which contains the Kaplan's fibers. These Kaplan's fibers, the anterolateral ligament and the lateral capsule, basically these fibers which are called the capsulo-osseous fibers, these are the ones that provide anterolateral stability and 
prevention of pivoting and controlling the internal rotation of the tibia. These fibers are probably the most important fibers that prevent pivoting in an ACL injury. Recently, there has been a lot of hua about this new ligament, so-called the entrolateral ligament, as claimed by Claes. We've seen that this was already described by Sigon and others. And as yet, this particular ligament is not yet resolved in terms of its attachment. Some say that it is anterior and superior to the lateral epicondyle. Others believe that it is probably pro proximal and posterior to the lateral epicondyle. However, Claes has done some selective cutting of the... Uh, ligament and he has shown that when the ligament AL, ACL is cut, you only get a grade 1 pivot. If you only cut the ALL, you again get only a grade 1 pivot, but if you cut both, you would probably get a grade 3 pivot. However, the Imperial College, both Emmis as well as Andy Williams, have done an exhaustive study on the lateral structures and they believe that the entrolateral ligament is really not very important. It is the IT band with the attachments to the condyle, the lateral femoral condyle, which are the crux to prevent the pivoting in an ACL injury. So what is the procedure that is used? It's a very, very simple procedure. You take a lateral incision, a 10 by 80 millimeter graft is harvested, basically keeping it attached to the Gerdes tubercle, passed under the lateral collateral ligament, and then it is fixed proximal and posterior to the epicondyle in 60 degrees of flexion with very little tension, maybe uh, just about 20 newtons. So it is the lateral incision in line. You have, sorry. You go anterior to the posterior border of the IT band because all the important structures are from the posterior border of the IT band. So you need to be slightly anterior to the posterior border when you take this 10 millimeter graph. You can just be about 25 millimeters proximal to the LCL that you can actually feel there. So you need have to always take an 80 millimeter graph. You pass it under the lateral collateral ligament like so and then you select a point which is proximal just about 5 millimeter uh, 10 millimeter proximal and 5 millimeter posterior to the lateral epicondyle. You can fix it in various ways. You can either fix it uh, with a screw or with, a, uh, with an anchor or with a staple. I prefer using the, the uh, anchor because uh, invariably there is a coalescence of tunnels when you are using the ACL as well as this particular tunnel which are going from the lateral epicondyle area. So what are the do's and don'ts as far as this procedure is concerned? First thing is do not go too posterior to the epicondyle. The moment you go too posterior to the epicondyle, you are going to make the whole structure very tight. Do not put too much tension. This is not uh, a sort of a ligament where you got to really pull it. It is a restraint to prevent internal rotation. And the most important thing is never fix this graft in external rotation. It has to be fixed in neutral. You fix it in external rotation and then you are going to really constrain the lateral compartment completely. The important thing about this particular procedure is the fact that the lateral collateral ligament basically acts as a pulley. So it doesn't really matter where the proximal, that means you do not have to concentrate on isometry. You can go as proximally as you want on the lateral femoral condyle as, you, as long as you are in line with the epicondyle. So what would be the indications? Now I have a lot of indications for this. Young patients, especially the pediatric sportsmen, because they have a very high a rate of failures, those patients who have basically a high pivot, hyperlaxity, genu recurvatum, part of hyperlaxity, where you are anticipating pivoting activities. You know that this particular person is probably going into some pivoting activities like basketball or football or something, maybe you are going to add an IT band. In all ACL revisions, because you want, don't, do not want to fail anymore, in female athletes, because we know that the failure rates are very high, Obviously, when there is an MRI evidence of a lateral capsular injury, then you want to reconstruct it. Those patients where there is a propensity to a failure, like a higher posterior tibial slope, also in minuscule deficiencies, and where the BMI is more than 30. So there is a sort of a guideline where certain uh, points are given for each of these indications. And depending upon the type of surgeon you are, you may either define five points or ten points where you would then add an IT band tenodesis in these patients. So in our unpublished uh, data, we have a total cases in just about two years, 116. 
we've had only one failure that to basically because of uh, a fall this was in 11 months had to be revised detailed results are awaited but they are very encouraging biomechanically really there is not much of a difference in terms of restriction of internal rotation by either a ALL that is an anterolateral ligament reconstruction or an IT band tenodesis and if you look at the network meta analysis of randomized controlled trials you will find that the outcomes following a LET are definitely enhanced over just an ACL reconstruction. So what are the advantages? It decreases the stress on your ACL graft by almost 43%. Obviously there is a reduction in the pivot shift and if you just do an ACL reconstruction, invariably you find that the rupture rates are almost 11% which come down to almost 4% when you add an LET to it. So this is an excellent study where two groups of patients, 90 patients each, they were followed up 100 months later in one group, only reconstruction, other group reconstruction with ALL, both were sort of matched, 16% failure in ACLR and only 3.5% failure in those in which the anterolateral ligament has been added. So it gives you a better IKDC score, a better KT1000 in terms of stability and obviously the ch less chances of any graft's failure. And therefore in conclusion, Addition of an LET in indicated cases of ACL reconstruction improves the failure rates of isolated ACL reconstructions. Thank you. So we're open to questions now. All of you who've got questions, if you could identify yourself and to whom you're asking the question, it'll make it a little faster. We've got about seven or eight minutes for questions. Is it open? Hi, I'm Dr. Milin Surwade. My question is to Dr. Anand Joshi. Sir, uh, so what kind of prehab do you start the patient of ACL on? For how long? And whom do you label as a copers for conservative treatment? So, I think my prehab predominantly uh, is dictated by the bruising seen on the MRI in the acute stage. So, if there's extensive bone bruising which we see, it's almost like an impact fracture. I very often like to uh, put these patients on a non-weight-bearing uh, thing for at least uh, a week to 10 days before we start range of motion. The basic idea is to make sure that the associated injuries uh, along with the ACL heal before you even decide to do anything with the ACL. We often see that the MCL is uh, injured with the ACL, one of the common injuries associated. And we feel that if you go ahead and do an ACL reconstruction in this situation, the patient is likely to land up with severe arthrofibrosis. So the aim of prehab is basically to make sure that the swelling reduces, the patient gets full range of motion, he is able to walk without a limp, and then if he has symptomatic instability, only then we would consider uh, doing surgery. There are enough and more patients who after doing a proper prehab may not experience instability at all. And these are copers and unless you give them a chance, you are not able to differentiate between a coper and a non-coper. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Mithen Chet. Thank you for the informative lectures. My question is to Dr. Dinsha, sir. Uh, what sutures do you use for suturing the remnant especially to the graft uh, in those third type of cases, absorbable or non-absorbable, why and what size? It's a zero number fiber wire. I think a zero number fiber wire is very easy to pass with the present instrumentation. It's not too weak like a two zero which may break because you're going to start off your rehab and your weight bearing and everything else remains almost identical. So for me, two zero, a, uh, a zero number fiber wire is probably the best. There's going to be a small knot out there and typically we've seen from our experience with meniscus repairs that these knots really don't cause any impingement. They synovialize well. So for me, the best suture is a non-absorbable one, which is strong enough and which is wide in diameter, so therefore zero fiber wire. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon all, I'm Rajiv Kulkarni. I have two questions for Dinsha sir and one question for uh, panelist. Uh, question to Dinsha sir is, first is, uh, the small graft you mentioned for uh, type 1 uh, uh, cases, so do you prefer peroneus longus in those cases or uh, hamstring? I typically will only take a single 
hamstring. So that will be the semitendinosus. And I'll either quadruple it or triple it so that I have a graft between seven to eight, depending on the size of the footprint. I don't want a graft that's too small because just in case your remnant doesn't heal, it's going to become a small diameter ACL reconstruction that's going to fail. And if it's too large, then you're going to have impingement, which is also going to fail. So I think for our ideal size, normal patients, it's 7.5 or 8. If you've got a larger patient, they may move up to 8.5. Very thin patient, maybe a 7. Okay. But that's your typical internal, uh, biological internal brace. Thank you so much. Second question is, um, at subacute stage when you... Uh, tend to operate these cases, uh, how much is the healing potential of the remnant, do you feel? So most of the studies show that your healing of the remnant can only upper, occur up to 12 weeks. So therefore we call these as subacute, 6 weeks to 12 weeks. So if you're going to do remnant preservation, it has to be between 6 weeks to 12 weeks. Now, I'm a strong believer, as Dr. Anand Joshi mentioned, that some of these ACLs can actually heal. So therefore, I don't go in for so many primary repairs. I'm going to give that patient some chance for letting that acute inflammatory episode recover. I'm going to then try and see, is he having any instability or not between the 6 to the 12 weeks? If he's having instability, I'm going to jump into it. To be quite honest, 12 weeks is not adequate to determine whether he's a coper or not. So sometimes we need to take a call. Mm -hmm. If he's a high demand individual and he's got a grade 3B Lackman, I'm going to tell him, look, we're going to lose that opportunity to do a remnant preservation, especially if he's a type 1 or 2 on the MRI. Mm -hmm. If he's a type 3 or 4, I'm not going to be doing too much remnant preservation. So I'll then wait and see if he really becomes a coper or not. Thank you so much. Uh, Dinsha, I have a question for uh, all the panelists. My name is Dr. Roshan Wade. Uh, basically, my question is, uh, when we come back to Lamer, Dr. Uh, Narvekar said about Lamer, then you came back on the, uh, the uh, complete uh, uh, repair of this uh, torn ligament from the femoral side, right? And somebody is talking about ACL primary repair. So if you see the historically, uh, repair pattern and uh, injury pattern of the knee joint. Uh, when we started knowing about Lemaire procedure, it was in 60s, that was the fashion. We started with the ACL reconstruction, then came the BTB, then came the hamstring, and probably the hamstring era is an era which is a weak era, and that is why probably you need the additional procedure. So my question to all the panelists, are we doing injustice by doing hamstring ACL reconstruction instead of BTB or CQT? Because none of those uh, BTB or CQT had associated a uh, revision, high revision rate as regards to the hamstring. Uh, I think, uh, Roshan, first thing is that uh, when Lemer did those procedures, they were only extra-articular procedures. They were not combined with an intra-articular ACL reconstruction. The type of graft, yes, definitely is important, but you got to select the graft depending upon what the demands of that particular patient are. And the, what his demands are going to be in future, if he's going to be pivoting in future, then whichever graft that you use inside needs to be protected. We have as many failures, literature, literature will show that the failure rate of a bone patellar tendon bone is almost probably one or two percent less than that of any other graft. But that does not mean that, you know, BTB in any which way is a very superior graft in all situations. Uh, BTB doesn't have a pivot. It can be uh, related to the quadriceps mechanism, the patella tendon, avulsion. The other complications are higher. But if you see the uh, pivot shift after BTB is very, very less as compared to the hamstrings. On the contrary, I think what is less with a, uh, with a BTB is probably the anterior translation because it is a rigid graft. But the problem is that because it is a rigid graft, it can prevent you tend to be a little bit more central and therefore pivoting in a BTB is found to be far more than that what you would occur with a hamstring graft. The other thing is you need to be anatomic and probably literature has showed recently as a matter of fact that the best combination for an elite athlete like a footballer or any other contact athlete is a combination of bone patellar tendon bone with an extra articular tenodesis that has the least complication rate. So there is no question that the extra articular provide a lot of rotational stability, which graph to use would then depend upon what the patient's demands are after your surgery. We have some more questions. Yes, please. please. Uh, Milin Saudari here. 
question chiefly to Abhay because he spoke about extra articular. This is expanding the gamut of this, uh, you know, this conversation to congenital deficiencies of the anterior cruciate. We've been trying with the Macintosh over the top, which combines the extra articular and the intra articular. But I do confess I have close to 40% failure rates with that in fibular hemimelia, proximal femoral deficiency, all the congenital ones. So, uh, your experience firstly and your recommendations for ensuring that the, you know, the stability of the knee, because it becomes manifest at the age of 10 and 12 years when they put on a lot of weight. It's a congenitally deficient ACL, it starts acting up in symptoms later on. So, your experience and pointers to ensuring stability in reconstructions. I, I personally believe that these congenital absent ACLs have basically a uh, bony deformity or a bony abnormality. They could be having an associated higher posterior slopes, which sort of puts far more load on both the ligament as well as the extra articular structures. So maybe we are looking at the wrong place when we are reconstructing these people. Maybe we need to add a little bit more with these pediatric patients who have a congenital absence of ACL. Any other factor and any other solutions? Milan, did I get you right? So you do only the lateral extra-articular without an anatomic ACL in these? We do the Macintosh over the top because we want to get rid of the IT band which is you know going to cause problems with future lengthening. Yes. So we harvest that, use it as an extra-articular as well as an intra-articular. Okay. So okay. some suggestions for one correcting the slope if it's increased, that's one. Any other? I think you also need to see the notch. So in these patients who have a congenital we ACL can, deficiency, often can, they have absolutely no notch can, at all. So because there's no notch, if you don't do a notch plasty and you have secondary impingement, I think that could be one of the other sort of failure rates. But I think most importantly, what Abe mentioned, that many of these patients are going to have secondary bony deformities itself, not just of the slope, but also of the condyles of the notch. And I think that these are probably the reasons why, as soon as these patients get older and more active, then they're putting more loads on that, you know, healed reconstruction, and that's when they start failing. Right. My last question uh, to the panelists is, uh, does the presence uh, of constitutional alignment in the players necessitates the need of uh, ALL uh, reconstructions preoperatively? Any thoughts on that? Nikhil? Alignment for ALL, I don't think so. I think the alignment needs to be corrected in case there is issue with the alignment. It is the pivot which dictates, for me at least, the reconstruction of the... Okay. Uh, doing I'm a going to rephrase right. that question. So yes. your question is, if it's an athlete who's got a varus knee, a congenital physiological varus knee, and he has an ACL tear... Constitutional. Varus. Constitutional. Abhay, would you consider an a LET in these scenarios to decrease your chances of graft failure? Thank you, sir. I think I would uh, use them in a valgus knee more than in a varus knee. Because valgus knees are the ones that tend to have a pivot much more than the varus knees. Okay. Okay. But the otherwise, the uh, IT band tenodesis will depend upon his demand. Okay. Okay. Like varus would be more common in a footballer, so probably you would add it only for that reason. Uh, we've been, I think, thank overshot you, our uh, allotted time. Uh, uh, I thank think, you, uh, gentlemen. Dr. You've, uh, you've successfully kept 200 orthopedic surgeons away from lunch. I think that speaks volumes of the, of the scientific you know, intent. Thank you so much and I think we can continue these questions into lunch because there's a really short lunch break. Uh, thank you gentlemen, thank you Dr. Ayer, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Narvekar and Dr. Padiwala for conducting this session with such great swagger I would say that uh, you've really kept people away from lunch. Uh, it's going to be a short lunch break, Wyrock doesn't afford too much, uh, you know, too much time off academics. So we'll see you all here back at 2.15 for a riveting session on uh, what I did and what I wish I knew then. You cannot miss that session in Hall A, so see you all very soon.